Consciousness. 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 It's like the ocean. The ocean. The ocean. The ocean. The H2O network. Purveyors of passion. Seeking to expand human consciousness from the deep depths of the universe of your soul. And welcome to the H2O Network. This is your host, Dia Nunez, broadcasting live from New York City. I'd like to welcome everyone in the chat room, everyone on the phone lines, and to everyone who will be listening to this via the archives later on. Family, make sure that you go to the HO Network profile page on Blog Talk Radio and download us via iTunes. That's right. You can take us wherever you go. You can catch up on everything that's happened in 2011 and all of the wonderful and beautiful things that are happening on the HO Network in 2012. Many fascinating individuals, tons of people who are innovators and bring new perspectives to our human reality. Also, family, make sure that you go to the HO Network website at the hshownetwork.weebly.com. That's the hshownetwork.weebly.com. You can also email me at the H2O Network at gmail.com. That's the HO Network at gmail.com. And of course, family, you know that we're shaking it up on Facebook and all of these social networks. So type it, type into your search engine, D-I-A and N E Z. That's me, your hostess with the mostest. I have two profiles, friend and both. We have so many things that are percolating on the burner this year. Um, dealing with the elders and educators and research that is not really percolating out in the mainstream media, if you will. So make sure that you friend us. And also, if you are a creator and an innovator yourself, make sure you email me because we want to know about what you're doing. We want to share your purpose with humanity at this point in time. We don't have time to sit by the, the sidelines, if you will. So if you're an artist or a creator and you'd like to contact me, please do because we want the family to know who, what you are and what you're doing. Also, we're on Google+, Plus, we're on YouTube, and of course, you know, we're tweeting away with all of the esoteric beings, conspiracy theorists, shamans, scientists, academics, you name it, we're doing it. So type into your search engine, the HO Network, and you'll be able to find us there. Family, you know, well, first, this is the H2O Network, so you know that we talk about environmental issues of all kinds. And this next guest, um, I'm really honored to have him on the H Show Network and to spend time with us. Um, Dr. D- Dixon de Palmier, he has been called and coined the father of vertical farming. And let me give you a little information about him. He has spent 38 years as a professor of microbiology and public health and environmental health sciences at Columbia University, where he won the best teacher award six times. In 2003, he was awarded the American Medical Student Association Golden Apple Award for Teaching. He has addressed audiences at leading universities, including Harvard and MIT. He has also been invited to speak at the United Nations. In addition, he has been asked by governments of China, India, Mexico, Jordan, Brazil, Canada, and Korea to work on their environmental problems. Family, this is, I tell you, this past week um, I've been doing research on this wonderful individual and it's just, uh, it, it's amazing some of his ideas, very revolutionary um, and very innovative. And this is, we can create our own reality family. All it takes is one beautiful idea, if you will, in order to change our reality. And this is exactly what um, Professor Dixon is doing. And he's bringing so much to the forefront. I just heard him speak um, on a video with TED, my, one of my favorite organizations because they really highlight individuals in their innovativeness. So 
buckle your seat belts, make sure you're nice and cozy, you have your cafe con leche and your agua and you're nice and cozy because we're going to talk about these environmental issues and a, a possibility of a solution to what we're going through. Professor, I hear you on the line. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. How are you, dear? I'm doing wonderful. I hear you giggling on the line. You're, so, you're too good. You're too funny. <laughs> well, you know, my mother and father thanks you for all those nice words you just said. <laughs> well, it's it's very true. I mean, I, I we pride ourselves at the A-Show Network for really highlighting innovators, and people are really thinking outside of the box because this is what it takes um, in this day and age because we live in a in an indoctrinated paradigm of gloom and doom. Right, um right, right. We have the power within our being to take that seed of imagination and to, to spread it wide and to be innovators, and this is exactly how I see you and your work, and I'm really, really grateful for that, so thank you. Oh, um, you have to thank 106 other people, too, then, because uh, they're, I've published a book on this subject that you mentioned, Vertical Farming, and in the back of this book, I, I briefly acknowledge a major contribution of, as you put it, family. This was my family. I lived with these people for 10 years. Not the same people. My family kept changing from year to year, but they acted as a family, and they grabbed this idea, and they ran with it, and um, they sort of dragged me along with it. Uh, it's brain, brain power of 107 people thinking about the same thing for 10 years. That's what uh, I'll be talking about. Well, I, since you said that, th I don't know who you are completely, family, but thank you for your contribution because this is what it takes and this is oh, very, very important. And first of all, before we really delve into the issues that you present to humanity, what is vertical farming, um, if you will? Well, I'm so happy to be on your show today rather than, let's say, two years ago. when, If you would have asked me what the vertical farm was, I would have had to tell you what I thought a vertical farm was. Today I can tell you what a vertical farm is. So to, between uh, two years ago and today, there are now eight examples of vertical farms throughout the world. So it depends on where you go as to which version of a vertical farm you're going to see. But let's talk about the idealized one first. It's a tall building, and inside the building uh, we grow fruits and vegetables and herbs. Sometimes chickens, sometimes shrimp, sometimes mollusks of various kinds, uh, both freshwater and saltwater. In other words, it's a food production center that uh, employs technologies of hydroponics and aeroponics. And uh, I know a lot of your listeners will probably grimace at that <laughs> when they first hear about it because it sounds like it's uh, an industrialized process to get all the flavor and uh, textures out of our foods and and sort of make it into a commercial venture. But actually, it's, it's quite the opposite, uh, and I can easily speak to that later in the show. But uh, So the vertical farm basically is the ultimate source of local grown produce. Uh, it, it can happen right next door to where you live. So I think that's the virtue of vertical farming. It's so immediate. You, you plant the seeds in the nursery, you put them into the grow systems, they grow up, you harvest them, you sell them, and you eat them. And uh, the harvesting and selling and eating can be done within an hour. So it's got some virtues here. It has a lot of virtues, I have to say, doing my own research um, on the back of what you've done and what you talked about. Mm -hmm. This is very, very important. This could literally change the facet of many um, angles of how we do things in our daily life, and it stems into being able to recycle. It, it stems into soil. That's it right. stems into water, which mm -hmm. is like water. gold. And, <laughs> That's right. That's uh, and a right. lot of people perceive that we live on, uh, I guess you could say, a paper money type of economy. To me, that's an illusion. To me, water is, <laughs> is the liquid gold right. of this economy. And, that's right. uh, you know, you get little hints of this. For example, President Bush, former President Bush, bought a huge property in South America that has a huge aquifer. It's like one of the biggest aquifers on the planet. And, you know, when I saw this, I began to ponder, like, what is really going on um, in the global scheme of our resources for this individual to be able to buy this piece of property and to be sitting on it? So we have to really pay attention. And this goes to my next question. Why, Professor, do you perceive that there's so much cognitive dissonance? 
from the general public and yeah. to a certain extent from a global government standpoint because they're really not addressing the issue, if you will. Uh, you're quite right. And, and one of the biggest issues, as you point out, is water. And you can't live without it. So you you can't live as yourself without water, and your plants can't live without water either. So 70% of the world's available fresh water is used for agriculture, irrigation. And um, unfortunately, that ends up spoiling the water for other uses, namely drinking, because usually there's uh, some added products that are put onto the soil, which wash off once you irrigate, and it spoils the drinking quality of the water. So uh, many people throughout the world are forced with having to choose between safe to drink water or their food. And this is a big tragedy in the making. And then, and of course, there are no uh, governmental agencies out there to try to deal with uh, such a global problem because it exists in many different places. Uh, the best way to deal with it is to try to work out another way to uh, to use that water for a more efficient way of growing food and save more of it uh, for us uh, to drink. And uh, in fact, uh, as we speak, uh, I know you can't see this because I'm sitting in my office at home, but my screensaver has an enormous... Uh, a vistal view of the coastline of Yucatan in Mexico, and I'm looking out at the ocean right now, and I'm thinking, what a wonderful planet this is. It's got gorgeous beaches and beautiful palm trees and all this water, but a lot of that water out there is not drinkable and not usable. So uh, we really don't treasure our uh, resources the way we should, and I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Indeed, and, and there, I think that there's this misconception, if you will, from the general public about water, that it's this resource that um, I don't know if it, I should, if it would be ignorant for me to say that comes out of thin air, can be reproduced, uh, yep. if you will. But mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, is that the water gets recycled, and the same water that the dinosaurs drink is the same water we're drinking. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> so it's not um, it's not something that can actually be replenished. It just gets recycled. That's true. And I, I perceive also that we're not even, I, I believe that the planet only has access to 2 to 5% of the real um, reserves of water, if you You're will. Right. It's all tapped yeah. up in glaciers. That's right, or salt water. Absolutely. So this can really solve our, our, our issues, if you will, in a, a multitude of areas. Now, what is commercial farming as far as, as water really, uh, really done to the essence of, of groundwater, to the, mm -hmm. to the essence mm -hmm. of soil? and all? What is the damage that it's doing? Well, the poster child for that one is California, uh, without a question. Um, California has, over the last... 60 to 70 years, uh, gone from a, a marginal agricultural state to the major food producer for most of the United States and for many parts of the world as well. Uh, if your listeners will recall, I mean, some of them must be as old as I am, so <laughs> if you think back to the, uh, to the late 1950s and uh, early 1960s, uh, when California was first coming up to speed with regards to how they produce their food, uh, you can remember a lot of deals that California made with the state of Colorado. Uh, the Colorado River forms a major source of water for the irrigation projects in California. So they made a deal in those days with the state that appeared to have so much water they didn't know what to do with it, so they gladly sold it to California. And that began the, uh, the most uh, ambitious irrigation project, I guess, that the earth had seen up to that point. The northern half of California, and I'm not going to make this a long presentation, but just to say that uh, the northern half of California drains through the Sacramento River drainage system. There are two rivers that lead into the Sacramento, the San Joaquin, and uh, another river that I'm blocking on the name of right now, but everybody would recognize the name if they went to the map and looked it up. But the southern half of California has no drainage. There's nowhere for irrigation water to go. Mm. So when you irrigate in the southern part of the Imperial Valley, or the Central Valley, as it's called, uh, that water just soaks into the ground and it doesn't go anyplace. You talked about the aquifer before. That just takes all of the unused portions of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, which they have to use to make their crops grow efficiently, and it, it soaks it down into that aquifer, and then it starts to build up. So this aquifer now, the 
contaminated aquifer that was created by this intensive uh, uh, outdoor agricultural strategy of flood irrigation. By the way, it's a terrible waste of water to just flood a whole field and expect some of the plants to take it up. <clears throat> up, up comes this aquifer until it finally reaches the bottom of the tap roots of the ones that are, have the deepest tap roots, and that hasn't quite happened yet. But the prediction is when it does, it will kill those plants because it's so toxic. So California has a huge problem mm -hmm. of the southern part with an aquifer that's poisonous and a, an upper half of California, the drainage basin of which is the Sacramento River. But, of course, all of that runoff goes into that ecosystem and spoils that as well. So San Francisco Bay is incredibly uh, overloaded with nutrients.